send it out to every mining school in the world. Is that going to hurt your career? And yeah. Went, no, I don't think so. And I said, right answer. So there were, um, we put it out and there were, there were 5,500 requests for the data, which we sent out on CDs. They came from 50 countries and we ended up finding $3 billion worth of gold. Wow. Uh, uh, and it was it really demonstrated that you know the the biggest gold mine in the ear, in the world is between everybody's ears yeah. and how do you connect it yeah, um, yeah. so uh, it was very exciting we had lots of uh, it started a gold rush in the area uh, around our mine in the district uh, we hired a number of people that participated in the challenge mm -hmm. And we went here with me today is mining titan Rob McEwen, who is the current chairman and chief owner of McEwen Mining and was the founder and former chairman and CEO of Gold Corp. Today, we'll be discussing three key topics, including the early days of Gold Corp, which grew from 50 million to 8 billion market cap under Rob's leadership, building McEwen Mining into the next major gold player and the creation of McEwen Copper, which is set to debut on the NASDAQ and Rob's investment philosophy and why he continues to be bullish on commodities with this, with the focus on juniors. Rob, thank you for coming on today. Thanks, Sunil. Great to be here. Great. So yeah, let's, let's, let's go back to the mid nineties. Um, you know, when gold corp was started, you, you were struggling enterprise. Then in 2000, you launched the gold corp challenge, putting maps and geological data out to the public and giving out $575,000 in prizes to anyone that could help locate the next high grade deposit, which inevitably led Gold Corp to becoming one of the most profitable gold companies in the world. What was your thought process on starting that challenge? Well, it, it had origins earlier on. Um, back in 95, well, I'll step it back. I'd gone through a corporate restructuring and we'd put five companies together over eight years to create Gold Corp. And once we cleared that, uh, we started putting money in exploration. So uh, I reduced the debt in the company, which we bought some companies. And then um, I said to our exploration crew, here's $10 million, go explore. And that was in uh, late 94. They came back or late 95 and 96, they came back in March and said, we have nine drill holes. The average grade is nine ounces per ton over an average width of eight feet. <laughs> wow. I said, that's really good. Um, yeah. That was 30 times the grade that was being mined at the time at our Red Lake mine. So I just said, well, spend that money as fast as you can. And if you keep getting the same results, I'll give you another 10, mm -hmm. which we did. And the deposit started growing in size. And then in 99, my um, head, of ex uh, head of production came along and said, well, we're going to build a mine, a new mine, because there was an old mine there. We're going to tear it down, build a new mine. And it will be um, this size. And I said, why is it going to be so small? He said, well, that's based on what we know of the resource. So I went to our head of exploration and said, um, how big is this deposit going to grow? And he said, I don't know. I said, all right, how long is it going to take you to find out? He said, I don't know. And I said, I don't like either of those answers. <laughs> so um, that, I said, well, where do we go to find out? Can we find expertise elsewhere in the world? There's greenstone belts or similar geological settings on every continent. Maybe there are people there that um, might have a different view of how big our deposit is. I wasn't sure how to do that. And I'd enrolled in a course at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology down in Boston um, on information technology, because I thought the mining industry was rather primitive, at least the mine that I had. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn about more about IT and how we could apply it. And then when I got down there on the second day, right after lunch, the prof started talking about open source code and Linux. And I went, wait a minute, 
this is how we're going to get to the world. And I ran back after the course to our office and said, um, guys, we're going to take all our geological data, throw it up on the web and ask the world to tell us where we're going to find the next six million ounces of gold in our mine. And they said, why do you want to do that? <laughs> yes, you don't give away all your geological data. And I said, why not? Well, someone might buy all the ground around us. I said, well, we have 55,000 acres or about 25,000 hectares. We haven't explored all of that. So uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Well, someone might take us over. I said, well, you we have options and they're going to have to take it over at a premium. So uh, we launched the contest and I guess the head of explorations, I, he was still concerned. And I said, well, your name is going to be on the front cover uh, when we send it out to every mining school in the world. Is that going to hurt your career? And yeah. Went, no, I don't think so. And I said, right answer. So there were, um, we put it out. And there, there were 5,500 requests for the data, which we sent out on CDs. They came from 50 countries. And we ended up finding $3 billion worth of gold. Wow. Uh, uh, and it was, it really demonstrated that, you know, the, the biggest gold mine in the, ear, in the world is between everybody's ears. Yeah. And how do you connect it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it was very exciting. We had lots of, uh, it started a gold rush in the area uh, around our mine in the district. Uh, we hired a number of people that participated in the challenge. Mm -hmm. And we went from, I guess, a relatively small Canadian gold producer to having a very large market cap, uh, having a very profitable mine. We went from produce at that mine. We went from producing fifty thousand ounces to five hundred thousand ounces a year, mm -hmm. and our costs went from three hundred and sixty dollars an ounce to sixty dollars an ounce. Holy! So, so there was a sixty-fold change in the economics. And I guess around that time, so this would have been what two thousand is when you launched the challenge. Yes. And then two thousand and one is when that next you know gold rally kind of took off, right? Yes. And it, so. It was it was considered one of the first examples of incentivized crowdsourcing. And Newsweek named us as one of the 50 most innovative companies on the web. Yeah, I saw that. That's uh, unbelievable. And, and were you worried at all when you, when you, when you did that? Like, was, your, was your team not worried that someone could go in there and stake around you? Were you worried that you would have lost potentially you know, the next major deposit if you did bring all that all those people around you and and putting all your data out there. I didn't really feel that way. I thought one, it was a good way of checking our methodology and conclusions. If you had all these people looking at it, yeah. If, if someone had come along and said, "Now wait a minute, <laughs> you did a wrong calculation on your resource there or your reserve grade," uh, that was with the nervousness in the geology department that someone was going to call them out. And I went, "Well, you said." You've approached this in the best way known, and and the market accepted it. Uh, yeah, but, but you have all these third parties looking at it because you wouldn't want to come out and say you have this, and then a little bit later be like Briex. And yeah, so a great deal of nervousness in the market because of Briex. So geologists really didn't want to stick their head out very far because they figured to get chopped off. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, because then, then they introduced what National Forty Three One Hundred One, right? The standard and all that stuff, and then there was a huge, you know, on on a compliance on a compliance thing of what you were looking for and and how you did these resource calculations, correct? Yes, yes. Right. So, so yeah, that got that was a very interesting time for for the mining space, right? Especially all the money that was you know made and lost on the Briex scandal, right? Yes. Yeah, because I, I had I had Warren Irwin on yesterday and. He was trading Briex when it was at fifteen dollars, and he cashed it all out at what two hundred. He goes, so that was his first first win. He made three and a half million bucks in the nineties when he was a young thirty year old guy on Bay Street. So um, he got out of that. He he he, you know, he he was lucky. He was one of the fortunate few. But you know, most of those people lost their money, and you know, it's you know created this this whole new world that we do that we live in, where you have to have compliance and quality insurance and all that stuff, right? Yes, yes, and a lot more um, guarded comments. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And independent as well, right? You can't just, you know, you got to bag up all those cores. You got to make sure it's labeled and all that stuff, right? Absolutely. And it, it, it's good practice. It's good practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then after that, so that that would have been, so when did you step aside from Gold Corp? 2005. So after 2005, you stepped aside and wh what was that period like for you? Because between 05 to about 08, there was, their gold was still moving, right? There was still lots of action in the gold space, a lot of deals happening um, leading up to the financial crisis, right? So what were you doing in, the, in that period? I know McEwen Mining popped up. Uh, what, year, what year did that all come about? Oh, well, McEwen Mining wasn't until 2012, but okay. um, in, in the summer of 2005, I bought into a little company called U.S. Gold. U.S. Gold, okay. I had property in Nevada. Um, I, had, I had run Gold Corp for 19 years, and I have to say I was getting rather tired of corporate governance and, and the <laughs> impact of corporate governance on boards of directors, particularly my board of directors. They were all trying to cover their ass. Um, I wanted to grow. Um, I thought corporate governance, it's well intended, but it's very poorly applied. Mm -hmm. And there are some really nonsensical things about it that I felt like a bull in a field and there's a red flag and I'm charging at all these illogical approaches, whether it's the corporate um, compensation committees and the auditors, the extensive documentation that no shareholder usually reads. And you're producing all of this for a bunch of parasites that are taking money from the shareholders. Oh, so yeah. I, I looked at it and said, um, I've had a great run. Our shareholders have done really well. Um, we have 400 million in cash. We have no debt and we pay a monthly dividend and we're the lowest, one of the lowest cost gold producers in the world. I said, this is a good time to walk away. Yeah, And so I looked around, saw a company that was trading at a third of our net asset, our net, um, net present value multiple, and that was um, Wheaton River. Yes, and Frank so, Dustra. So I went and approached Frank and Ian yeah. and said, uh, let's get together. Um, I'm stepping down. You guys can run it. Um, I've got lots of money here and we've got great assets. Uh, we'll build a bigger company. We'll come together at a very low premium. I think it was 7%. Um, and we're going to see the stock rocket. Yeah. And I, I was a 13% shareholder. So um, I was inclined to see it climb. Yeah. Uh, and then and then it ran to what, 28 billion market cap the, in the combined company, something like that something in that like period? That. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they, uh, I think they got carried away doing too many corporate deals, but yeah, uh, that's um, but no, it had a, a terrific run. Yeah, right. that's so. Then you stepped aside in 05, and then and then you then you got into Nevada. You were folk, you you mentioned that you focused on Nevada, so you got into an early stage Nevada company. What 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 was what was the thesis behind that? Uh, while I'd been at Gold Corp, I'd been approached by Rothschild to see about buying RTZ's 40% interest in Cortez Hills. 60% was owned by Placer Dome. Um, and that introduced me to the giant gold deposit down there. Uh, so my geologist didn't want to go after it. But um, when I left GoCorp, I went, OK, here's a company right below um, Cortez Hills in this giant deposit. So, and they've only, there's been a lot of exploration on it, but they've never gone to depth, it appears. So um, I went in there and then I would, I was buying 10 to 30% interest in junior mining companies. So developed quite a portfolio of them. And then I started merging a few of them. So that would have been from 05 till about 2012, and then you renamed it McEwen Mining. Is that kind of how it happened? or? Yeah, well, it was U.S. Gold. Uh, we went, I bought in at $0.35. Cents. Um, seven months later, it was trading almost at $10. Holy. Uh, did a financing. Um, and we were exploring in Nevada. It drifted down. Yeah. Um, 
And <laughs> like all the other resource stocks by 2015, it was scraping along the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, 16, 17, it ran back up to $9. Mm -hmm. um, and then we <laughs> bought a couple other things and it's drifted down again. Uh, right now, there's a couple of bad management hires. Um, operations didn't deliver on guidance. And we're turning around right now. And we have a large copper deposit that's um, behaving quite well right now. Yeah, and I guess that goes, that goes, you know, well, let's let's first finish up on McEwen Mining and then we can talk about Los Azules because that seems like it's your guys' crown jewel now, right? Within that, within within the McEwen enterprise, right? For so, the moment. For the moment, yeah. I mean, I, I was looking at you guys' your assets. You guys got tons of things you guys are working on, tons of things on the go, right? Yes. So what's the plan then with, with McEwen Mining? You built it up now. You guys are you guys are becoming the next major gold player, you know, with the with the focus on creasing ounces, right? Uh, in a non-dilutive fashion. Um, what's what's the five year and ten year plan for, for McEwen mining? I would like to create another gold core. That might mm -hmm. be a, sound very ambitious where we are right now. Mm -hmm. But Mother Nature has a lot of surprises in the ground and um uh, I think we'll find one of those or two. Um, so if I look out at Gold Corp, we started paying a dividend once a year, then quarterly, then monthly. Um, I'd like to get to that point at one point. Um, I'd like to adopt more innovation in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. That'll show up more uh, earlier in our copper project, but I think there's a lot of room for um, utilizing some of the technologies that are out there uh, to improve mining, make it safer, more profitable, a bigger contribution to the country, um, and a uh, longer mine life. Sure, sure. Uh, and do you are you going to keep McEwen Mining focused in the Americas uh, when you when you when you when when you when you when you plan on creating the next gold corp here? Are you looking at outside the Americas? Are you are you looking at Africa? Are you looking at any other places where you can get those discounts on those type of deposits and put them into production pretty quickly? Or or like what's what's your what's your focus there? Right now it's the Americas. It'd be, it's just easier. You're within a similar time zone. Yeah. Um, once you start moving abroad, say to Africa, not only do you have time zones, you have different gov governments and cultures. Oh yeah. I, I, not that we don't have different cultures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In South America, yeah. Or Latin America, but it's. I can take it one at a time. Yeah, yeah. I've done quite a bit of stuff in in Africa. I've done a lot of stuff in the DRC, and I can tell you, Rob, it's 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 an interesting place to do stuff, right? Um, things to, things go to slow, right? Uh, slower than molasses, right? So. Um, if you don't understand what's going on, you don't understand, like you said, the culture thing, you don't understand how business is done there, you're, you're going to get left left in the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So so moving forward then, so talking about Los Azules, as you mentioned earlier, um, that's kind of turning into its own beast, right? You've raised quite a bit of money to date. I think you just, I saw a 42 billion uh, pesos deal done by Stellantis, which is obviously you know, you, you Fiat, Jeep, Maserati, Ram, you know, one of the largest car manufacturers in the world. What's their, what's their reason on getting involved with you and, 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 and maybe a little bit before their reason, but how did you get them involved in the beginning? Um, they are, um, they operate in Argentina yep. where Los Azulas is located. They produce, um, a little more than 160,000 vehicles a year. Uh, they're committed to being all electric in uh, in the 2030 sometime. So they're looking for copper. Uh, they also generate revenues in Argentina and their exchange controls. So they could invest in a property in Argentina, use those pesos. Mm -hmm. uh, so one was from a supply standpoint and two more efficient from a, a financial standpoint. We committed to 
be net zero by 2038. Wow, that's, it, yeah. it was the first time a um, major automobile company purchased an interest in a copper deposit. Anywhere really? Wow. Yeah, because you hear these guys getting into these lithium deals, right? Um, yeah. um, but you, I haven't really heard. I mean, this would so Stellantis. When would they? When did they make the original investment into McEwen Copper? Well, that was in um, the begin end of February, early March of this year. Of this year, and that was was that for the other forty million that you put up to match, so eighty million total. Was that what it was, or was it split between them and uh, Rio Tinto? I, I put up forty million personally in the summer of twenty one. Okay. And then, as we mentioned before, we got on the air. It took about a year to find the other forty two, yeah. and twenty five of that came from Rio Tinto. Yeah. So the number two mining company in the world, and then there was a, an Australian group that came in for ten and some other smaller individuals. So with my 40, that made 82. And that was um, last year, last August. Um, and a year ago, August. And then um, Stellantis came in in February, March of this year. Um, so the first issue was done at 10. The second issue when Stellantis came in was done at 19. And so in that issue, Stellantis and Rio invested. Rio did 30, Stellantis did 30 billion pesos. Yeah. And then more recently, just in October, um, Rio came in for 10 and Stellantis came in for 42 billion pesos. Understood. And then now that is what's valuing McEwen Copper at 800 US million approximately. Yes. So well, now the goal here is to, what's your plan? Do you, I mean, obviously when you're a private company, it's very easy to keep that valuation. Obviously when you go public, that's when things get interesting. Is it going to go to 10 billion or is it going to, you know, where, where, where is it going to land? Right. So what's the plan here? Are you, are you going to keep building it privately and then come out with the number you guys feel is correct for it and then debut it or, or debut it and see how the market reacts to it? We're um, moving the project towards a feasibility study, which we hope to get out in the first by the first quarter of 25. Um, and we have, we're sufficiently funded to do that. Mm -hmm. And we thought with greater detail on the costs and what we have, it would be, we'd be in a better position to raise the money. Also in this type of market, it's nice to have a, a large bank account mm -hmm. to weather this storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and plus it's part of it's still with it's a subsidiary of McEwen Mining still, right? So, yes. um, and McEwen Mining owns forty seven percent of that. So technically, anyone that buys McEwen Mining, you know, they have a direct interest, right, in that, right? And how would you guys do it if you guys were to take it public? Would you guys do a like a dividend to shareholders or just keep it on the McEwen balance sheet? How would you look at that? We've looked at it. <laughs> Um, from several ways. There's a tax implications if you dividend it out to shareholders. Okay. Um, which would cause some shareholders when they receive it to have to sell it right away to pay the taxes. Yeah. Or raise capital. So we're trying not to put people into a taxable position yeah. when they get an interest. Um, we do retain um, NSR on losses of less of one and a quarter percent. Um and we have another copper project in there called Elder Creek, which is in Nevada in, uh, in the uh, Cortez trend as well. Um, and R Rio Tinto's exploration arm, Kennecott, is exploring it. They've, they're earning an option on that property. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, maybe there, there's a chance of having a royalty company spin out of this. Uh, wow. That would be massive, right? Because because royalty, I mean, as you know, like that's you know, Cisco, the Cisco Group did that, um, right? Um, Sean Rusin, Robert Wares, right? They did that when they sold the original Cisco Mining. Who did, yeah. who did, did they sell it to? They sold it to you, if, Gold Corp, I believe. 
Oh, to go, yeah, well, that would be not me. Not no. you, but you know, you, yeah, 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 yeah. That's when they were going on acquisition uh, spree, right? So, and then they obviously had uh, a Cisco Royalties, which is, you know, which is the leaders in the space. So um, you guys being with gold producers and now this Los Azulas, if you spin out this royalty company and it starts making money, like like what, what I don't know, one and a half percent royalty you, you guys would have on a Los Azulas potentially? One and a quarter. But- one and a quarter. If you look at it, what it would pay out at 375 based on the PEA we just published, yeah, I'd be paying out more than a billion dollars over the 27 years. Wow. So that's oh. what is that? That's divide that by 27 years. That's that'd be what is that? Uh, five, 50 million a year, roughly. It's a nice number. It's a nice, yeah, it's a nice number. So at today, then McEwen Mining is five four hundred fifty five million market cap. Half of they own half of Los Azulas, which is valued at eight hundred US million. Plus, you then get this potential idea of a royalty company on top of that. So and you get the gold companies, and then you get the gold com- You get the gold for companies for free. That's yeah. that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good system that you created there, right? Well, when I was our share price was hit really hard because we our operations missed guidance yeah and yeah so that it just fell down and the value of los azulis was obscured by the bad performance yeah and, and people would look at it and say all right it might be a big copper deposit but you don't have any money in your treasury to fund it and so i said well let's separate it and surface the value in it by funding it separately so that's yeah why I, I was the lead order of 40 million i said let's start it on the path and i did think it'd be a piece of cake to raise the next 40 or 42 um <laughs> but it took a year yeah <laughs> and then since then i mean if you converted the pesos to dollars at the official rate i mean we've raised in the last two years more than 360 million dollars us wow um, in a market that you can't raise money. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, it's it's really tough out there. I mean, th- this is a time where, I mean, you would know this better than anyone, right? You know, markets come and go, right? You got, even though you got the underlying commodities, gold, silver is up 22% over the year, you know, it's performing quite well, but there's a massive disconnect between the commodity price and the juniors or even the producers and where they trade, right? And have you seen this before in, in, in you know in, in your in your experience over, over the last you know several you know decades of you doing this? Oh, yes. Have you ever seen the, the metal prices perform this well, but the juniors are just lagging and, and and also the producers are also lagging? 87. Yeah, 87, okay. We had the correction, gold took off, as did the gold shares. But by January, the gold shares were going down, gold continued going up. Uh, We saw it after the global financial crisis. um, Things were just being, values were on the floor for the taking. Uh, Right now, I think it's just a a very opportune time to be building a portfolio in gold stocks. 100%. And there's discount, you can get, you can get deals on things because people can't, they can't develop them, right? So they need guys like yourself that has experience that has the capital behind them that could put up their own money to develop it and that could potentially sit on it. Right. Um, And, and, you know, that's, that's, that's where, you know, wealth creation, generational wealth creation comes from. Right. It's a cyclical business and we're in one of those cycles. Uh, We've seen huge monetary stimulation, Mm -hmm. a lot of debt with interest rates rising. There's going to be some liquidation. Yeah. Yeah, like Janet Yellen, what did she do recently? Yeah, had to get up to almost twenty percent before it stopped the gold rally. Yeah, I think Janet Yellen, what did she do? One point six trillion in debt that she just issued. I don't know if you saw that. Um, what did was she do today? Not today. It was when did she do it? I was talking with uh, Peter Groskopf about it. He's he's actually coming on later on today. Um, something he wants to. That's kind of what he wants to focus on. Um, and he's basically saying people are like, you know, the policymakers, they're, they're losing their mind down there. Right. The, you know, the secretary of treasury, like, the, you know, Jan- Janet Yellen is, you know, they're, they don't know what's going on anymore. Right. They're just trying to keep the, 
the economy afloat and they want to keep their stock market moving, right? Yes. Um, but then what does that create when you start printing all that money? Do you create an environment of a Venezuela potentially in the US where the Dow Jones is at 100,000 points and a house, a two bedroom apartment in you know California is 5 million, like, you know what I mean? Like just start picking numbers, right? And yes. that this is when it gets crazy now, right? Like when people have no idea what's what's going on, right? And things just, it's like a reverse cross. It just only goes higher, right? Yeah, we just look at, I mean, our own government is spending money all over the place. A lot of it going outside the country and not dealing with medical lineups or homelessness or cost of goods. They oh. throw carbon taxes and all sorts of other things that are making it much more expensive. Yeah, 100%. You can't get out of it, right? That's, uh, it's, I guess there's 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 good and bad to it, right? Because you need the economy to keep growing, right? But there's also a level of how much you can have it grow within each period, right? Which in annual period, I think what do they say? Two percent is an, on as a good average, you know, two maybe two and a half growth. So where the Canadian dollar is relative to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and what do we have? We have lots of natural resources. Mm -hmm. We need capital to develop it, mm -hmm. but we're not in a particularly friendly spot for foreign capital mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the resource sector. Mm -hmm. But if we could get our dollar back up to par by selling a lot of exports of yeah. natural resources and developing it, it cut down the inflation dramatically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess so that's what happened in 2010, 2011 when, when you saw the dollar come to par, right? We were, you know, metal prices, resource prices were just going crazy, right? Um, and, and the dollar was at one point, I think it was stronger than the U S dollar, right. Um, yes. for, for a few days there, right. It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't there for a while, but you know, it's pretty impressive to have the Canadian dollar stronger than the U S dollar. Right. And we could, like and we, we could, it could happen again. again. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's great. So why don't we talk a little bit more about, uh, Los Azulas? Um, you know, so you, you, you you still plan on having this the feasibility out in 25 and then what's the plan here? When do you, when would you like to get production online for, for, for something like this? Oh, you wouldn't see production until 2030, probably 2030. Okay. 29, because you get the feasibility study, then you have to have some engineering and permits. Mm -hmm. um, then you have to build. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it will be an open pit. We've, um, I'm quite excited about Los Azulas because we're looking to approach mining in a different way. Mm -hmm. One, to be attractive to youth to join us. Two, um, we, rather than going the conventional route with um, crushing, grinding, flotation process, uh, we're looking to use a heat leach process that will use um less than a quarter of the water of a conventional size plant comparable size conventional plant uh, we'll be having an eighth of the carbon uh, a fraction of the capital there'll be no tailing stem to uh, act as a potential danger for downstream um, and we're going very electric uh, two two years ago i brought in an architect who's considered uh, the Steve Jobs of the green living sustainable building space. Wow. And I asked him to come in and help us redefine mining yeah. and come up with some great ideas and renderings and helped us develop our philosophy to create a regenerative mine um, that you're taking, like just looking at accommodation in a very large translucent building that generates its own power, collects its own water, grows a large part of its food, deals with its waste, has hanging gardens, is a very comfortable place to live. We're in the center of it via hotel. Uh, we're bringing people in to see the site and to treat mining, not try to paint it out and camouflage it and hide it, but to make it a jewel that the country and the community could be proud of. Yeah, sounds like you're, you're, basically, you're basically making the Tesla for mining. Well, that's a way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely with with all those ideas you have. I mean, 
this is going to be, or it's going to be a 30 year mine life, right? 27 years, I believe. Right. Um, well, that's only mining a, a third of the deposit. Yeah. So this could be multi-generational, multi-generational. Exactly. Right. So you'll see this thing, you know, you could potentially create, you know, a, a Disneyland for, for the copper, for the copper, copper bugs. Right. We're hoping that what we do here will serve as a model for mines in the future. Amazing. Um, so moving forward then, let's let's talk about your philosophies. Um, are you solely focused on the mining space? Do you do you do you venture outside that? I know I know you're a big donor to you know very various charities and 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 other philo philanthropy, you know, efforts. Um are you are you focused mainly on you know charitable giving and 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 mining? Is that kind of your two main philosophies these days, or do you do you look at things outside that? And, well, in two thousand and three, my wife and I funded the establishment of a research center for uh, stem cell research, regenerative medicine. So I've ventured into that field a little bit uh, with investment, um, but I'd say. Largely, I'm in the natural resource sector. In in mining, it has been gold largely for most of my career, and um, now copper in a very big way. Yeah, hundred percent. And and nick nickel or or any other sectors you or uh, commodities you like or anything in in particular. But that's uh, like there, outside there the. Some, there is some nickel, um, but it, it's largely the precious metals, copper. Uh, you know, some other ones drift into my orbit, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we've, a lot of it is also just looking at what can be done. So um, there are leadership programs that I've funded, um, School of Architecture at Laurentian University. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into the arts, but it's trying to help train leaders. Um build better structures, more responsible to the environment and uh, get mining on a, on a different footing. Great. Better footing. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I think that's, that's, that's everything for today. I don't, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add or anything else you want to speak on, but you know, I really appreciate your time, Rob. And, you know, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. We really appreciate it. Um, and everyone else that's watching, please comment and put any, um, anything down below, any questions that you might have on, on the current markets and what you are viewing, you know, commodities, companies, uh, you know, what Rob likes, you know, he likes, he likes gold. He likes, you know, copper now um, and, 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 in, and in safe jurisdictions with the focus on the Americas. Um, but appreciate everyone's time. And thank you, Rob, for coming on today. Thank you very much, Sunil. I'll, I will say that for any of your younger audience, they might want to consider looking at mining. It's one of the highest paying industries in the country. It uh, requires a diversity of skills, whether it's IT or um, artificial intelligence is coming into that, robotics, um, environmental and strategic planning, community relations. All of those skills are required and it's experiencing a labor shortage right now. There's been a huge decline in people going through mining schools, schools of geology, and that's at the younger end of the equation and at the upper end of the workforce, you have all sorts of people going into retirement. So for someone who wants uh, to advance their career correctly um, and be paid well for it, uh, they should give it a close look at mining. Hundred percent. I I would I would agree with you. Hundred percent. I think mining is something people are slowly forgetting about, but they don't they don't realize that they need mining in their everyday. You know, whether that be in their phones, their tablets, whether that be anything, right? Computers, everything, their cars. You know, the electrification push that we're doing. Mining is essential to that. So, the more and, people that are coming into it, the better it is, right? And for investors. Uh, I think we're entering a period where you could see the type of returns tech companies gave um, being delivered by the juniors. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred x or thousand x revenue, or not profitable for 
50 years are ever, never profitable, <laughs> right? Like some of these <laughs> tech companies on the NASDAQ these days, right? Yes. Well, great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sunil. Yes. All the best.